So on your TV, there's an image of an astronaut on the moon. And next to the astronaut on the moon is a flag. And on that flag is not the stars and stripes. It's a logo. M T V. A channel that plays music. But they don't just play music. They play music, videos, movies that go with music. Music, television. The year is 1981. MTV. For us, the year is 2001, episode 323. I want my MTV. Rick, what say you? There's a lot of times when you can um you can recognize a game changer and uh, MTV was one of those things and it's not just that it was a music channel it wasn't just that it was a, um uh, putting a visual to these songs which had been done before um but it was it was really the it was a change in in the presentation of um, a certain type of cinema. I mean, the three to five minute long music videos, and in some cases, these extended length mini movies like uh, the John Landis directed Thriller. Um, I don't remember who who. I don't remember who um, uh, directed Black or White. It might have been John Landis again. John Singleton doing Do You Remember the Time? Martin Scorsese doing Bad. Um, but then you had the the birth of a of a whole industry of directors that would come out of the music video industry. David Fincher, which I think was uh, Vogue, and uh, Spike Jones, whose collaboration with the Beastie Boys on Sabotage and a couple other things were just like I mean, you were seeing these weird little mini movies that were other level type shit you would see you would see homage to to um fritz lang's metropolis you would see um these throwbacks to 1970s cop television you would see all kinds of really weird interesting and um and in some cases challenging movie making and uh it was more than just let's put a camera in front of a band and see what what we can capture. It wasn't one of these point and point and shoot type situations. They were really creating stories and worlds that would influence cinema as a whole. Movies changed. The movies that you saw in theaters um, began to adopt a great deal of what you saw in those videos. And um, a lot of that was the cinematography. And um, I just think it was a, it was a real miracle, miracle time. It was just, you were seeing some really bold, audacious shit. But also, when when MTV wasn't just a, um, a garbage heap of Jersey Shore reunion specials and spinoff series, and um, when it was really doing something uh, challenging, even in the early days of the real world, it looks quaint and kind of stupid now. But there were some there were some real chances being taken there, and um, you know I'm, I I was one of those I was one of that that revolution of I want my MTV and you were sitting there watching it. it that was the thing that you turned on as you got home from from school it was no longer Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch and reruns of different strokes and the facts of life and all that shit you were going to see what was you were watching uh, what was the show TL. There was some. Which one? What's that? Which one are you saying? TL something. There was a. It was a. It was a top ten show. Um, what's his name? That fucking guy. Um, oh shit! That white boy, who had his own talk show late at night that that lasted for years and nobody ever watched it. Car Carson Carson Daly. Um, oh yeah. He had a show TL or something like that, and um, 
you had Yo MTV raps, you had uh, all kinds oh. of weird shit, and MTV was one of those places that was really taking chances until, like anything, um, they started making money, and then it just went safe. And I, I can't tell you what's on MTV now. I couldn't. I I haven't watched it in years. When I'm at my mom's house, who has cable, I don't turn it on. I I have no idea what's on that show, what's on that station. I mean, it was generational. Yeah, it's it's uh, and with the times, I mean, now it's like it's a different thing, but back then it was all of these things that you described. It was cutting edge, and it continued to develop through the '80s into the '90s before it became, yeah, just mm -hmm. uh, from the real real world into Jersey Shore. Yeah, um, it was one of the uh, one of my favorite episodes that we've done. Uh, oh, it was I a mean, great time. It was like it was it was a it was a time travel episode for us. Yeah, nostalgia factor, yeah. time capsule, talking about generationally Kurt Loader as mm -hmm. a um, as and knowing that this is an exaggeration, but we describe him as uh, and other people have too uh, as like Gen X is Walter Cronkite. Mm -hmm. um, or at and, the very least, the closest thing that we had to a Walter Cronkite. He he was somebody right. that our generation really listened to and respected in a way that the, the earlier generation had done with Walter Cronkite. I mean, it's 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 a weird exaggeration to compare the two, but it's not I don't think it's an exaggeration for the reality of it, you know? It's it's that it's that weird um it's that weird dance that you do with something like that. Well, I mean our generation had the the what? And Donaldsons of the world. Oh, the yeah, um, the Sam Donaldsons and all that. The the actual like Peter Jennings mm -hmm. and these these um these news and you know and an a little bit older it's like Barbara Walters, Hugh Downs, mm -hmm. um these these kind of um in the studio news talking heads, yeah. but there was more of a sense of um that this is these are journalists um different from today different yeah, from oh journalists yeah journalists yeah um some of the you know the people leslie stall and these people on mm -hmm. on uh, on 60, 60 minutes, minutes. Yeah. Uh, morley morley safe safer and all these people um you know you had those um but kurt loader was the guy who was going to let us know what was going on here on the scene mm -hmm. or, or uh, Tupac or Kurt Cobain or, or uh, whatever happened in the news. He was the guy because it, it was in between the videos. It was in between the Headbangers Ball or whatever it would be, Beavis and Butthead. We had liquid television. It was super experimental, fun, open, um, and to see the development from, of that, and to see things change from the '80s into the '90s, and um, you know when you, see, you have an '80s version of Michael Jackson and an '80s version of Madonna, and to see them develop because they're you know they're the ones that had the, the videos that were so prominent. Yeah. And so cinematic, um, especially him, and to go from Thriller and and Billy Jean and all these into the Remember the Time or into uh, Black or White, you know Macaulay Culkin and and uh, and to have those videos first, you know, some of them first air on uh, was it Black or White was the one that aired on on Fox. Yeah, so, uh, I think they, they got a, and, yeah, they got a lot of problems because of uh, the whole destroying the car thing. I destroying remember. the car, grabbing his crotch, mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of like, at that point, you know, I was looking at Michael Jackson as a little bit like, not he wasn't passe, but he was just he was definitely wasn't like on the cutting edge of coolness to me. Yeah, um, but he still 
who was Michael Jackson, who still knew, knew how to put on a show, who still knew how to perform. Sure. And 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 who performed like a dynamo on the on camera. Um, and so to revisit that, to go through all of that with uh, with with MTV and and Daisy Fuentes, Fab Five Freddy, um, Kennedy, who's now this big time right winger. Um, Kurt Loder is like right libertarian, whatever. Um, none of that like was necessarily like thrown at us then. It was just it was the music, it was the whatever. But um, you know the downtown Julie Browns of the world, um, Ricky Rackman, all of these old school, Holly Shore, um, old school. VJs that we would see day in and day out that would bring us what was happening in the music. Um, it's like your friend uh, Joey Diaz has the, well, I don't know if he still does, but his show was the Church of What's Happening. I was like, MTV was the fucking Church of What's Happening now. Yeah. Um, and the generational channel. So that, that, that was a, uh, episode 323 fun episode to revisit check it out it's in the archive 321 i'm going a little bit backwards we did vertigo um i mean fear of heights obsession hitchcock stewart novak vertigo is one of the great films of, of cinema history yeah Universally acknowledged as one of the great films. I think it was um, for the longest time in the in the AFI polls and the British, uh, it would go, it would go back and forth between Citizen Kane, Tokyo Story, and Vertigo. And the last I read, Vertigo With was because a lot of thrown in too. Yeah, but yeah, all of those films are just like um, these these uh, the pillars of the great great world in American cinema. Just it's it's crazy how important these films are and how much they they affect us. If you don't know Vertigo, you don't know. <laughs> if you like David Lynch and you don't know Vertigo, go watch Run. Watch Vertigo. If you like Vertigo and you don't know let David Lynch, go run and watch some David Lynch. Um, Hitchcock, we, we've talked about Hitchcock. We're going to talk more about Hitchcock. We're going to talk more about Lynch. We're going to talk more about Jimmy Stewart. We're going to talk more about everything, but, um, Vertigo is just one of those films that's, uh, it's foundational and it's, um, it's just a fucking mysterious, beautiful movie. Well, I think it's, um, yeah, it's foundational in the annals of cinema. There's so much that comes out of it and so much that is derived from it. And it's, um, it's one of the great filmmakers tackling one of his most, um, I guess, personal obsessions because it, it's starting to come out now. I think it was known then, but it's starting to come out now, especially in the Me Too movement era of, um, Alfred Hitchcock's predilections and, and, problematic behavior and um when you're a when you're a fan of cinema actually when you're a fan of all of the arts any of the arts whether it be um whether it be the the domineering role of of alfred hitchcock or kurosawa um the the misogyny of 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 um pablo picasso beethoven the outright um, criminality of Roman Polanski and Bill Cosby, there, whether you like it or not, there has to be an acknowledgement of bad behavior going hand in hand with genius. That's not to say that it is essential for that or that it gives anybody a pass. And we've talked about this on, I can't remember the episode that we did about the Me Too movement, but we did talk about how... Uh, how you receive and embrace the art 
after it becomes clearly apparent that these are bad men. These are questionable, these are bad men of questionable character. And Hitchcock's, you wouldn't have a film like Vertigo if you didn't have Hitchcock's questionable behavior, attitudes, and um, beliefs. Uh, does that make it right? I don't I, no, but um, no, it, it doesn't make it right. But uh, the film is still an incredible examination of those of those problematic uh, demons, I guess, or or problematic um, abuses of power. They exist. The film exists, and there's a lot to be taken from that. It's a problematic film. And it's even more... And and the, the film subject matter itself is problematic. This The way this character is obsessed with the past and um, shaping somebody into his ideal. It's a, it's a... Watch it now. It's fucked up. It's a fucked up movie. But it's rooted in a reality that you can't you can't deny. So I think, I think when you go to the dark places and you find these things that, um, that make us, um, difficult in so many ways, you, you really do mine. You do find the diamonds and that film is definitely a diamond. It's an incredible example of one man's, um, and not just one man, but all men involved. Jimmy Stewart and his performances, this this wounded. Um, you know, we've talked about Jimmy Stewart before the war and after the war. The effect that it had on the character, that it, the George Bailey character from It's a Wonderful Life. When you see the Scotty character from Vertigo, that's just, that, that's that's the breaking point. That's the PTSD with with no with no treatment no relief no um no sense of of um of closure i think it's a brilliant performance and a brilliant film and not to dismiss or to uh, or to um excuse alfred hitchcock's behavior but god damn it um the film the film screams of of an artistic achievement that I don't know it wouldn't have been possible without it because you wouldn't you wouldn't have that behavior. It's a fucked up movie. You got to watch it again. I mean, yeah, it's 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 Brian De Palma, um, Brian, Brian De Palma's origin story, basically. Yeah, basically. Dress to Kill oh. is basically is basically um, Hitchcock without the Hayes Code. There you go. I mean, that's a good title for an episode. Yeah. Um, it, it's this is something that um, like exists in the history of art, and I don't just mean abusive behavior. I just mean the idea of the. I mean. The concept of the male gaze um, sure. in, in feminist thought, um, it, that's a thing. Whether one agrees that it's a thing or agrees that, that it should be a thing or whatever, it's a fucking thing. And there, the history of art is the history of that. Um, that's what it is. And... So, as people who engage with art, we have to come to terms with um, both sides of that coin. We have to come to terms with, okay, this person, this was, this art was created by a person who, on some levels, may or may not have been fucked up, just because that person is a person. Um, and how do we approach this work of art while acknowledging how fucked up and how? Uh, abusive or whatever that person is or was and how do we approach that work of art 
while acknowledging that and use that view as a critique of the work and how it may have informed it, but also how, how the work may be redeeming, not just for that person or maybe not for the person at all, but redeeming for the human condition in spite of the person's fucked up behavior, fucked up way of being, fucked up uh, political views, whatever rather than just well this person uh this person was known to run red lights so their art is like more acceptable because that's as far as they went you know it's a different story if you're like well this person used to kick babies then it's like well <laughs> ugh, you know that's yeah. uh and then this person did art that portrayed kicking babies but that person actually like was an amazing uh an amazing dad and a boring person but they channel all their stuff into artwork about kicking babies so um eh, maybe i don't know how we feel about that this person was a, this other person was an amazing person um and their art is very boring so this is acceptable or someone else is going to say nah if you don't have three felonies, your art ain't shit. Someone else is going to say, um, oh, this person was the greatest painter in the world, but was a serial rapist. Um, what, do, you know, what do you do with all that, right? Um, it's kind of like, well, you got to include that in the conversation. Um, but if you look at a Picasso, and you're you don't know anything about his life and you're it's hard because it's like in order to really know about like to appreciate art you have to know about art you have to have seen a lot of art because you're developing these skills um you can just look at, at, a, at a painting and say i like it or i don't like it that's easy everyone can do that There's also like, oh, this is what this person was doing because I know that this was what influenced this person. Then the next layer is like, oh, this is what this person was doing because at that time he was cheating on her with her. Yeah. See that painting over there? <laughs> that's the that's her. And see how this one, see how he fucks up her face? You see how you can see both sides of her of her face, but she's in profile? That's because blah, blah, blah. And did you know that he said women should either be considered goddesses or doormats you know and then you you get into it and then it, it becomes at that point the work also becomes more interesting because it's more it's 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 more human like who said that fucking uh angels and saints are, are the only ones that are going to make art if anything our culture fucking has this idea that it should be someone who's all fucked up but then we turn around and then it's like well that person's all fucked up, so fuck their art. So it's very, you know, fuck Britney Spears because she's all fucked up. Well, it's but like, then, you know... like, well, <laughs> people are going to do all kinds of judgment calls, you know what I mean? And, and Polanski, look, okay, rapist. Yeah. Straight up. No question. Um, Am I still going to watch fucking uh, Rosemary's Baby? Yeah, I am. I'm going to watch a movie rape made by someone uh, who ended up fleeing the country because of his fucking uh, bad behavior and his abusive behavior. Um, and I'm, if I'm going to talk about the movie, I'll bring it up. I'm not going to not watch the fucking movie because of that. I mean, there are going to be limits. Those are Everyone has to make those personal fucking decisions. Oh, yeah. um, for each and every one of us, we have to you have to understand what your what your boundaries are. Um, yeah, and what, what do you want to participate in? Um, but it's also the type of thing where you you start to really you you really start to consider if let, let's say you don't know anything about the filmmaker and you're not familiar with their work. Um, we've talked in the past of how I never felt that I was ready for Bergman. Well, I've started watching Bergman, and the more I watch Bergman, I can't help but believe that there's a level of, I imagine, if I get a biography, if I start doing the research, I would not be surprised if I found a level of abuse 
in his relationship with women through his um, through his films. Uh, I just watched a film called Scenes from a Marriage. I watched the TV version, the five-hour version, and I was enthralled. I was, but I did not enjoy it. I did not like what I was watching. I was watching characters that I didn't like, but they elicited uh, an emotion. They were, they were the exact. They were the exact thing that I want out of a movie where I want to look away from the movie. I want to look away from the screen, but I want to, you know, I, I, you can't turn away from the, from the car accident. You can't turn away from the fact that these two people who supposedly love each other are so completely self and mutually destructive. And when you do that and take a look at the rest of, of a person's filmography, for you know, shame, um, Persona. I'm talking about the later, the later Bergman from what I've read about it because I haven't seen these films. But there is a, there is an, uh, there is the hint. Maybe it's a glaring hint. I don't know, but there is a hint that this is not a, this is not a man who understands stable or at least is able to deal with stable, stable, mutually beneficial. Uh, supportive relationships. I really do get the sense that this is a guy who who came from some, from, some, from some pretty dark places in his relationship with women, but um, he does give them a platform as well. If you've never seen the movie, I, I suggest that you, you sit down and you make time. Don't watch it with your girlfriend. Don't watch it with your wife. Just But, but it is the kind of thing that you watch. And you yeah, fuck her. Wow. Yeah, yeah, fuck her. <laughs> You don't want that shit coming back on you. You joke, but you do not. You do not want to be watching a movie and have your woman turn to you and say, "That's the same kind of shit that you do." What the fuck? Yeah, you know. <laughs> but it's good. It's good. Um, it's a difficult. It was a difficult five hours. So I'll say that much. I mean, look, I've been called. Someone looked at my fucking Instagram. Mm -hmm. Someone who I know, and jokingly, because I guess they felt like we're on those terms. Um. Uh. Said that my my Instagram is like a stalker's of uh, of the person I'm basic I'm the person I want to marry soon. Um, and I'm just kind of like, what? Um. So you can look at something, and you can derive whatever meaning. Yeah, because you can be completely off base. I don't know about Bergman's personal life, so we don't know. That's, that's the uh, thing. It based on the nature of the artist and based on contemporaries of his. It starts. It starts weaving this fucking maybe conspiracy theory thinking in your head of what this artist is, which becomes fascinating and. If you're like me with movies, it's never just a movie. There's a backstory to it. There's a backstory towards the creation of the characters and the story that you're seeing on screen, yeah. which makes you want to dig deeper and deeper into that. And when you have somebody who's acknowledged as one of the, I think probably the five five greatest filmmakers of a particular period. I mean, there's, there's Bunuel, Fellini, Kurosawa, Ozu. Mizuguchi and Bergman. Those are the, you know, when, when people, people who don't even know movies, they know Bergman. They're like, oh, that, that's that fucking Seven Seal guy. That's that chess and death. People who, they, you know, it, it's, it becomes part of the, the lexicon of, of, of the language of film. And then. Yeah, the image. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they know the image. Yeah. Uh, it's, it becomes like, oh, there's this Japanese dude on a swing. I've yeah. seen the movie. No, you haven't, you piece of shit. Yes, I have, you fucking asshole. Maybe. If Maybe you had I seen have. the fucking Fuck movie, you'd remember the fucking movie. Don't give me that shit. You'd, you'd remember. It's the image. It's the image. That's that's my point. It's not it necessarily. Is. It is. It's there's not necessarily the whole fucking that. movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, that's, well, that's why shit's on a fucking poster. Like, that's what you remember. You know what I mean? Like, um, that's, that's what's so powerful. Too. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um. So it's like, oh, I've seen Uma Thurman's feet. Yeah, I don't know if I've seen the movie, movies, yeah. you know, um, from Tarantino's male gaze. But, um, but I mean that that that's the thing. It's like, uh, 
Ice T's cop killer. Does that mean that Ice T kills cops in his personal life? No. Uma Thurman's feet. Does that mean that um, that Quentin Tarantino is uh, is actually a foot fetishist in his per personal life? Not necessarily. He may just play one on TV. We don't know. Um, it's just things things that we see. Now, from their chess with death, we did an episode on Max von Sydow's death. Mm -hmm. Max von Sydow died the month that fucking um, COVID fucked everything up. And so that was going to be the episode that... Basically, the previous episode was on contagion and outbreak. And then the following week, um, we were going to do Max von Sydow because he, he died that month in March of 2020. And then it ended up being like, no, we're not going to meet up because things look crazy and we have to go buy fucking water and toilet paper and all this shit. Um, and so uh, that was it. Bye bye. I never saw you again. Yep. Um, <laughs> so Max von Sydow the sub and seal, the greatest story ever told, the exorcist, as if that's not enough. Fucking the original Doom, Hannah and her sister, Shutter Island, Needful Things. He played Jesus. He played a crusading knight who played chess with death. He played the devil. He played a priest who performs an exorcism. Um, kings, uh, the episode, you know, king, pre night priest, king, um, all with that voice, Bergman, all the way to fucking Spielberg. There's only one Max von Sydow. We're lucky to have had him. You know, he, he shows up on, he shows up on screen and you're just like, okay, let me, uh, this is a guy that I want to watch, and I, 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 I don't, I don't think I was ever disappointed in anything that I ever watched him in. I mean, Ming the Merciless, as bad as that fucking movie is, mm -hmm. and I know that's sacrilegious for a lot of people. They love Flash Gordon. I think it's ridiculous. He's a lot of fun, but I know you hate Strange. I don't know if you hate Strange Brew. I don't know if you, if you feel that strongly about it. I love Strange Brew, and I love the fact that Max von Sydow could either slum it that hard, right, or 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 just deliver something that I thought was brilliant. I I, I just love him in that movie. I think he's I think he's great. Um, but he's one of those guys where, as bad as that last season of Game of Thrones was, when he showed up. The majesty, the 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 nobility of Van Sydow, really, um, it informed. It informed that that seer character that he played, but also he could turn around and do one of the most touching performances I've ever seen on screen with um, Pele the Conqueror, which he's mm -hmm. on screen for maybe, yeah, he's the lead, he's the name, but he's on screen for maybe a quarter of either a quarter or one third of the screen time, but every second that he's on screen, you're, you're captivated. Your eyes are glued to him, his performance and what he's trying to get across. And by the end of that movie, you, you're, you're broken hearted because you know, you know that Von Cito has created something real and has given life to something that has existed throughout history, the, the immigrants plight. And, I dare you to watch some, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I say it all the time, I'm not some fucking bleeding heart that is, that is crying about the, the, you know, the, the lonely and the, the brave fucking, and all those that. Those fucking immigrants I'm invading not, us? I'm not, what you're yeah, but if you, if you start to see people and hear their story and, if you have any level of empathy, and that's what that's what films do, that's what movies are. They're, they're, they're this empathy machine that, when done well, 
they don't excuse bad behavior, but they offer you an insight into people and who they are. That's a weak man. That's a sad man. That's a man who makes choices and they fall apart. And it's a little, it's a bit of a tragedy by the end of that movie, but God damn it, do you not? It's hard to watch a movie like that and then see footage of, of people crossing the border and being um, stopped and being harassed and being um, treated the way they're treated and your, your, your heart and your mind start creating the stories based on something that a great actor has gifted you. Hopefully it makes you more empathetic. Hopefully it makes you more sympathetic. That's not always the case with everybody, but um, great performers do that. Great artists are capable of that kind of gifting. That's one of the great movies that I've seen. I, I, I really, I was really touched by that movie. That was, um, I love that film. I love that performance. And it was a, it was a great swan song for me on Von Sydow. Because it was, it was yeah. the last thing that I, mean, I watched of his. I mean, and it's, you talk about the, the empathy machine. Is it, is it Ebert that we've talked about the, the, the TV as an empathy box or yeah. whatever? Mm -hmm. um, that's a, that's um, from Do and Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Um, there's an amp empathy box. And so that's Philip K. Dick. Um, which that doesn't make it into uh, Blade Runner, um, but Philip K. Dick uh, this kind of this weird web in my head points it also at um, Sid Al because uh, the film with Tom Cruise, um, Minority Report. Mm -hmm. um, that's another Philip K. Dick yeah. uh, adaptation. Um, adaptation and. Um, yeah, Von Sydow, just that voice, and I think I said it on that episode. It's just kind of like in my head. Uh, well, there's needful things where he plays the devil, and that's mm -hmm. one of the one of those films that I wore the fuck out. Like in in you know ninety three, ninety four, whenever it came out, and I I rented that shit all the time. It was uh, and I you know Ed Harris, and I think it's just really interesting. Um, and to see him play that, and then to and then. You take that out of the fucking VCR and then you put in the exorcist and it's like, and that line, do not despise my command because you know me to be a sinner yeah. with his accent. And it's just like, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, no, there are very few people that could that could deliver on the level that he did. Um, and, and he would just do cameos near the end of his, the last two decades of his life, two or three decades of his life. His, his five or six minute part in Awakenings as a as an old doctor who who has watched these these men and women drift off into this uh this disease this encephalitis lethargica where where they're you know it's his there's something about being able to deliver a line with so much forth and force and gravita that if anybody else were to do it it would be labored and it would be um we talk about in indicating, we talk about acting that is mostly indication. You never get that sense with him, but it's, it, the pieces of, indi the elements of indicating acting are there, but the great actors are able to sell that in a way that bad actors can't. They don't have to indicate. They just, they, they just inhabit. Yeah. I mean, he's, he is that, I mean, it's, it's a great performance as he's, he looks like he's 90 in the film and he's, he's trying to smoke a cigarette and he's, he's defeated because he spent so many years working with these patients and, and ultimately being unable to, to help them or make their lives better. It's a very sad movie and it's a film that's made, you know, we, I wanted to do an episode about actors playing against type because that's definitely a, uh, a Robin Williams performance that is completely a game. I don't think there's anything else in his filmography that is like that. Everything else that he does has a moment of 
of Robin Williams being Robin Williams. He leaps out of whatever character he is and becomes Robin Williams. He doesn't do that in this film. I don't know how Penny Marshall was able to control him, but we talked a little bit about that with um, his work with Gilliam, where as, as much as I love the Fisher King and as much as I love him in it, there are many moments when he goes too far with it. Mm. Um, but he doesn't with Awakenings. Awakenings is so... It's so... Um, not calculated, but it's so... He's so straight-jacketed by the performance because the character is that. The character is a sad man who is unable to really... Um, express himself in any kind of he certainly isn't Robin Williams and to see him to see him and Max von Sydow on screen together the doctor who is barely getting into this world versus the doctor who has found it somewhat hopeless that scene alone is like a movie that that speaks volumes and you have two great actors delivering with von Sydow just just being my Fancito has to be one of the great one of the ten great actors in in the history of cinema i i don't i don't that's pretty bold i will say it he, he's there's not many that I think are better than him. You look at the performance and you look at at how um how invested you as a viewer are in everything that he does on screen and uh I think you'll be shocked. I really think you'll be shocked by how much you care about the characters that he creates. Um, and I don't know, I don't know of a lot of other actors that, that can elicit that type of sympathy. Daniel Day-Lewis scares the shit out of you. De Niro does the same thing. Pacino is bravado. Dustin Hoffman is problematic in so many different ways. Duvall is understated. Meryl Streep is the queen, the greatest, but um, Bon Cidao, I think it's because he's so rarely a lead. He's one of those guys, he's, he's a lot like Duvall, where he, he comes in, he delivers, he gets the fuck out. He's a utility player, but on a much higher level, you know? I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's the way I see it, where it's like, he doesn't... There are very few films where he, like, Needful Things, he's not the star of that film. I mean, he's the, he's the, he's our star. You and I. But the lead of that film is, is, um, that's Ed Harris, Ed Harris and Bonnie Bedelia, you know? Yeah. Um, Pepe the Conqueror, Pepe the, Pepe the, Pele the Conqueror, that's, yeah, he's the name, but it's that little boy. We're following that little boy's story. Um, Mean the Merciless, he's the villain. Strange movie's the villain. You know, he he's he delivers, but he's always right. that guy that he makes it possible. He's one of those rare actors that is able to be both a star, but also the guy that makes everything that the star is able to do possible. Yeah, I mean, look at the exorcist. Yeah. He's he's there supporting Yeah. Um uh, he's Jason, supporting Jason Jason. Murray. Miller, right? Yeah, Father. Father Karras. Father Karras, yeah. And um, and he's also there, um. To support Linda Blair's, uh, Reagan McNeil. Yeah, I think that's Reagan ultimately Teresa a hard McNeil. job. Yeah. <laughs> um, incredible, incredible, incredible performer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in in in, in um. In uh, what is it called? Uh, extremely loud and incredibly close. He doesn't even speak. Yeah, he's the only thing about so, that movie that I like. So, yeah. so take that. Um, from there, we uh, I'm gonna skip over one. I'll come back to it. We did John Waters. Um, one of my favorites. I mean, five. and that was a great episode. That was a great fun time because. John Waters is such a, the movies are so fucking out there, but John Waters as a character himself is a lot of fun. And we were able to find that, um, that, that one man show that he did, uh, yeah. this filthy world, which is better than the movies, but still from doing that episode, 
I gained a greater appreciation for, for the movies that he did. They're sloppy. They're in some ways they're badly acted and badly, um, you know, they, they have certain limitations, but they're unapologetic in their, um, they're unapologetic in their B movie status. And I, I love yeah. the fact that he leans into that. He doesn't allow that to, he doesn't allow that to hold him back. He's making good movies. They're good movies. They're just, you know, great B movies or even Roger Corman esque movies. Or, but God yeah. damn, I well, love Well, in some stuff. ways, um, Andy Warhol also. Yeah. Um, there's definitely some of that, and it's supposed to be like the queer elements and uh, and the campiness and all that. Um, so definitely the um, the filth, the filth and the fury, basically, yeah. um, and the humor, and and to pair that with um, with the profile of divine, I am divine. Mm -hmm. um, to see this in your face, out there material, but also this sense of like love in yeah. the sense of um of family and having his own little group of um of actors and 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 to have a, uh, a filmmaker come out of baltimore yeah um which is completely its own thing so yeah john waters is, is someone that will gross you out pink flamingos will gross you the fuck out yeah, you you don't watch a movie like that and not walk away a bit changed. Yeah, you mm -hmm. you are watching someone eat shit. Dog watching shit. somebody sing with his asshole and two people fuck a chicken. It's it's a weird it's a weird fucking movie. So, but within the enjoy. parameters of what it is, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really uh, and this is someone and this is perfect example of going back to what we talked about with um with Hitchcock, like this, all this crazy shit. And, and as ridiculous as John Waters is, you look, you look at him and you listen to him in interviews and profiles. And you're like, okay, this guy, um, this guy seems pretty well adjusted. Yeah. He's a pretty fucking like well adjusted fucking member of society who makes crazy out there fucking movies. <laughs> Um, that he does, you know, to to the right wing, he's gonna be like, "Oh my fucking god!" Like, um, well, to the right wing, he's everything that's wrong with America. He's exactly he's the he's the the horror that that is gonna um, that is gonna uh, um, turn your he, kids gay. Exactly, he's that cancer on your children, and he needs to be stopped. But in truth, he's a very he seems to be a very kind, sweet man with. Um, a sensibility, yeah. I, I I love him. I think he's great. I've I've paid to go see him and perform his one man show. I um I love everything about him. I think he's I think he's fabulous. I love him. <laughs> fabulous is a good is a good word. Um, we did Tenet, Christopher Nolan's film that was supposed to resurrect the the fucking cinema, cinema experience. Yeah. Um, and it just uh it was Christopher Nolan doing a spy movie um well i think it was christopher nolan without um it was a christopher nolan spectacle because there's a lot to admire in the film including a pretty good performance by both robert pattinson and john david washington um but it's a film that didn't it 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 was emperor's new clothes it was there was a lot of spectacle there was a lot of cool things to look at but Oh, Emperor's the story. No Clothes. The Emperor's, yeah, Emperor's No Clothes, because there, there was nothing there. It was um, it was a study in emptiness that uh, it was it was all flash. And um, I'm sure when you see it on paper, it's a pretty interesting idea. But being able to, to show everything run backwards, and I'm not talking about chronological storytelling. I'm talking about image being shown backwards and something acting forward i mean it's it's a it's an it's an interesting visual experiment 
but if it doesn't serve the material in the correct way, it becomes spectacle, and spectacle doesn't drive a story. And I think that's the biggest problem with the movie, is that the story is not worth the, the, the technology and um, what's, what is ultimately on screen. I really had well, a problem plus, with that movie. Plus, I mean, it's not that amazingly visual to be enough to not have those other elements. Yeah. This is kind of a, a this is a back and forth that you and I have. It's like if it's gonna be fucking um if it's gonna be super visual to the point that that um that you're you're not leaning on story or you're not leaning on um emotional content or whatever else like let's say these things that like typically you're like that's what you require or what mm -hmm. you demand, right? Mm -hmm. Um it it was interesting. The audio was, and this is obviously he did that on purpose for whatever reason. But the, uh, I know there was a lot of talk about what was going on with the audio. Um, it was a complaint yeah. that I would hear about or read about. Um, and I'm not going to have any sourcing on this. I'm just like Donald Trump. I'm just like you know, a lot of people are saying, a lot of people are talking, <laughs> but I'm just making this shit up. Um, you know, I, I heard. Um, Someone told. I me. heard that yeah. that that you know some very important people, um, people that like you wouldn't believe, um, heard that the audio it's like a, as bad as you've never heard before. Um, so there's that. Plus, it's kind of like if if you're gonna get into murky, lin uh, non-linear um, storytelling, that you can also do it in a in a in a mysterious and emotional way. Go to David Lynch. Um, to see it done in a different way. Um, this was, yeah, this was very cerebral. Um, mm -hmm. And, but trying to translate it into a James Bond, um, Christopher Nolan likes to make things complicated. Christopher Nolan likes to take kind of simple genre uh, things and turn them into something that seems like it's more so he can make a heist film with DiCaprio um but it's about uh dreams and and then I think and look I'm not taking away from him doing that um but at the same time it's kind of like he you know his prestige uh, uh film is magic film illusion film he in a sense is that person I, I don't know if I made this point then or i've made it at some point but he takes a simple magic trick and he makes it really complex so that it's more um it, it seems more impressive and he is a he's a great filmmaker i'm not i'm not saying he's not what i'm no, saying is that, that has come the concepts, that. yeah the concepts are are they're very much like get an index card and and try to write something interesting and then make this fucking like super complex movie around it. So like the index card is okay, heist movie, um, but dreams. And then, um, okay, all right. So then, okay, like levels of a building, you have levels of consciousness, levels of dreams, okay. Now we're gonna do the architecture of that. Um, I mean, that, that that's amazing. But at the same time, it's like the kernel is very, simple and so here it's james bond movie um and so it runs there's part of it that runs forward part of it that runs backward okay tenant okay it runs forward and runs backward um and the problem is that we're watching all of this stuff um But we still are like, well, okay, it's just a fucking palindrome, you know? Yeah. Um, like, at that point, it's a little, it felt a little flat. So um, from there, we did. Uh, well, it's a testament to to the the fragility of of filmmaking, is that you can have a you can have a pretty good idea, or at least what what appears to be a good idea. You can have a great director, 
great actors. Big ass budget. Big ass budget. I mean, seemingly limitless budget and technology to achieve a vision. And it could all go to shit because it just, there, there's an emptiness to whatever idea you originally believed you had. And I think that's part of the problem with, with this film. It just doesn't, it just doesn't deliver. It, it makes promises that it can't deliver on. And, you know, films do that from time to time. Um, this is one of them. It was, it was difficult in that way. We started with a series on rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that year we, um, episode 324, we did the origins in the past. This is called the history of rock and roll part one in the past we had touched on. And I think that one we called part one too, but who gives a shit? Um, we had done the yesterday film about a world where the Beatles had, what would happen if the Beatles had never existed. Yeah. Um, so then that was like a side thing. So then, um, so we started with the birth of rock and roll. Your, you know, Little Richard, mm -hmm. Fats Domino, Jerry Lee Lewis, Bo Diddley, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, um, Chuck Berry. The origins of rock and roll music and the films that kind of depict the biographies of these people, these biopics of of these early rock and rollers, um, and we moved do that from rock and roll to Dylan, two parts on Dylan, episode 329, episode 330, um, and to Bob Dylan's legacy, forward into the Beatles. Um, We did an episode on Paul McCartney because he has a documentary that he did with the producer legend Rick Rubin. Um, we went into specifically John Lennon and George Harrison. We went into the Beach Boys. Well, we we went. We did what we did from there. We did get the get back, um, massive fucking uh, Peter Jackson's get back, all this footage that he had to wrestle with and mm -hmm. released. Um, Phil Spector, you know, Al Pacino playing fucking Phil, Phil Spector. Um, and that's as far as he as we went for that year. So it was just, um, really playing with the idea of rock and roll and the uh, the depictions of these changes in culture that were happening sometimes like decades apart. So obviously like rock and roll versus like rock, right? Um, rock and roll, we're talking about the early days, the 50s. And then once you get into the early 60s, What's Dylan's impact from that side? From um, and and not only his musical impact, but how is how are the films that are related to him? How are those um, changing? For example, Don't Look Back, the D.A. Pennebaker um, film documentary. This this kind of this uh, mm -hmm. fly on the wall kind of thing. Fly on the wall. Um, cinema verite kind of thing um to the documentaries of martin scorsese no direction home mm -hmm. um to the rolling thunder tour and um, the rolling thunder tour uh i'm not there mm -hmm. where it's these different people playing these stylized versions of the stylized bob dylan playing himself um so to, to really see like not only when it comes to, and this kind of like comes to a culmination where we started with MTV, where it's like, and Scorsese is someone who's like really known to, for this too. Like, um, and, and Kenneth Anger is one of the godfathers of that, where you're marrying popular music 
with cinema. MTV obviously would have these little films for songs. That's what a music video is. Um, Kenneth Anger and his experimental films, his experimental films are basically like music videos. Um, Scorsese, think about the outro of Layla. And you think about fucking this murder montage, the fucking carbone and the meat truck frozen. Um, that's the part that you think of when you think of Layla because of Martin Scorsese, because of Goodfellas. Um, well, that's the beauty of it is that the music in our everyday lives, apart from cinema, music acts as a, as a soundtrack to our lives. So much of what we do, you, you hear music, music is playing in the background, music is playing in your car, you're playing music, you're listening to music. Um, maybe you're meeting with someone and you have something playing over, you're having dinner and you have music playing in the background. Um, it informs, but with cinema, it also, it also acts as a storytelling tool. So with something like, I mean, I can't, I can't listen to that song without thinking of Carbone in the Meat Truck. I can't think of yeah, you got without, visual. you know, yeah, you got that in yeah. your head. I'll, ne I'll never be able to separate those two things as <clears throat> from now until whenever Alzheimer's takes my memories away from me. I will never be able to not see that. Um, but it's also, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's Michael J. Fox at the, at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance going up there playing a Chuck Berry riff and then turning it into Eddie Van Halen. It's like, it's a story, it's a storytelling element that bridges, uh, uh, the, the elements of the film, uh, especially in that film where, where you have two different time periods going on and one informing the other and the other vice versa, where, you know, music plays such an important role in defining who we are and, um, and, uh, painting the picture of the world that we live in. So what was fascinating to me is, is how much of this music informs both the image on the screen, the storytelling that's, that's being, that, that, that we were taken in, but also is reflective of the times in which something is set. I mean, a lot of times you, you have, music is just there to give you a sense of where and when something is happening. If you watch Forrest Gump, most mm -hmm. of the things that tell you be, beyond just costuming is when you hear, when you hear Creedence Clearwater Revival come in with um, Fortunate Son, Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to Vietnam. Oh yeah, you know Some what I mean. Folks it, it just, it, born to raise a flag, you know, and it's like that's what you see. You take it in, and before you know it, you you know, it's the difference. But 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 it really comes down to is that who is able to do it with style, and who's doing it as a cheap manipulation of um, who's cheating the audience with this cheap uh, storytelling manipulation. Um, sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't. And there's a way to do it like that is, a, is it's using the context, the historical context and people who know, they know. So it's yeah. like, like you said, it's a, it becomes a shortcut. It becomes, you don't have to, there are certain songs that you can play that are going to give you Vietnam vibes yeah. because in documentaries, Hendrix means Vietnam. Um, if you see Hendrix and you see a palm tree, if you hear Hendrix and you see a palm tree, you know it's Vietnam. Even if the palm tree is, it's the Philippines because it's fucking Coppola or whatever. Um, if you hear the doors a lot of times now, you're going to think, okay, apocalypse because of Coppola. Again, um, fortunate son. Boom. The, the soundtrack of the fucking 60s. And it those some of those images are enhanced by films and some of them are just like Woodstock and we didn't get that far. Um, but just the, uh, the imagery of Woodstock, we didn't get that far in terms of our series, but, um, but those images come through. 
Then there's someone like a Tarantino who's going to take it. I mean, and Scorsese did that too. Layla, to put that for that, that, that montage is brilliant. Mm-hmm. If you're thinking Dick Dale, surf music, you're not, necess- you're not thinking fucking any of you fucking pricks move and I'll execute every last one of you. Um, and then here it comes. You're that like, oh shit, Misery Lou. Like, uh, what? Or if you're thinking Chuck Berry, like you can think, uh, you know, hell, hell, rock and roll. Like, this is Chuck Berry's aunt, motherfucker, uh, arguing with fucking Keith Richards. Or you can think fucking Jack Rabbit Slim's twist contest. Yeah. Um, and that's, um, there's so many. films that really like have these soundtracks that are loaded down and done in such a way that it's like, Oh shit. Like, um, Pulp Fiction is a great use of soundtrack, um, because they're connected to certain moments, but also it's kind of like, you can hear the progression of songs in your head. Um, American pimp is, is a, a documentary that, you know, we talked about it a few episodes back when we revisited that, but, great soundtrack and it goes so amazingly well amazingly well with all the profiles and and, and the, the editing and the, the way it's done is it, it's great so it's kind of like there's a way there's a way that it really gets into your fucking head and the commercials do that too we, we've been wanting to do an episode on music videos themselves mm-hmm. um and uh and commercials you know we'll do some of those but um Pay attention to how it's used well and pay attention to how it's just background. Um, music is more than background. Music is fucking the soundtrack. Um, that sounds very obvious. But think of, think of the shit that you were listening to when you were a teenager. Um, and a lot of those types of music or think of the music that maybe like um you were listening to growing up or maybe you know like certain songs go with certain like oh when we would we would all go to the beach or whatever the fuck and it's like and every time we'd get in the car my parents would play whatever song fill in the blank and that would be us um, it would be cop killer, you know, um, mm-hmm. I see fucking cop killer going to the beach and it was amazing time of my life. So now every time I, I hear fucking cop killer, I get all warm and fuzzy because I think of like family picnics at, at the beach because that's what it is. It, it doesn't matter what it is, but it has those things. It's like smell. It takes you back to a place in time. And then when you can connect it with that image, you got fucking MTV, you got rock and roll, you got you got what you don't have with Tenet. Because with Tenet, what is everybody saying? Rick Ramos, please fix your audio. We don't need to fix our audio. It's dirty because we like John Waters. It's filthy because we like you to buy us coffees. Buy me a coffee dot com slash watch rick ramos buy me a coffee dot com slash watch rick ramos this episode goes to danny s thanks for the coffee thanks for your time see you later bye bye all